Um, thank you, Anne-Marie, for that um, interesting overview. I noted your comment about leaving members of the public sector alone uh, and letting them get on with it. Now, I'd like to do that, but most of mine are here. <laughs> so we'll have a conversation with them afterwards about that. Can I thank CETA for inviting me along? Thank you all for coming to listen to uh, all of the presenters today. Um, interestingly, and I'm not sure if he's still here, uh, that doyen of the West Australian uh, political uh, press pack, Mr Kennedy. I'm assuming because a lot of people are pointing at him. Yes, there you are skulking over there like a typical Perth supporter. Um, one of my spies, well actually a number of them, Peter, in Twittosphere or whatever it's called, communicated to me or to others who communicated it to me uh, about some of the comments you made this morning. I'm hurt. I'm hurt, but your time will come, Peter. Um, I just wanted to point out to you, Peter, um, because I know you're well read and very intelligent. Um, in 2012-13, government spending in WA was 3.7%. Growth, that is. Growth of 3.7%. Lowest result in 14 years. Now, that's not my fault. No, it's because we had an election. So the thing is, if you want to keep government spending down, we should have an election every year. So that's my first policy announcement for today. And secondly, I heard there was some speculation on things like leadership. I heard you made some incisive, uh, incredibly wrong, but very incisive uh, comments. So I'd like to meet you afterwards and we'll exchange money by way of a bet uh, on at least my part uh, of the, uh, the formula uh, that you dreamt up somewhere. <laughs> what I want to do today, uh, I have 15, 20 minutes, is just really touch on uh, four things. Uh, firstly, uh, and quite briefly, just to reflect on where the Western Australian economy has travelled to uh, over the last few years, uh, because what you'll see is that 12-13 is somewhat of a watershed year. Secondly, where we think it's going to go over the next few years. Uh, thirdly, to highlight some of the challenges um, that have been appropriately pointed out that we face in government. Uh, and finally, uh, just to make some comments and observations uh, on, I suppose, the framework or, or the, the, the scene that we're building uh, the current state budget um, within. So I'm going to attempt to work this. Uh, yes, there we go. So the first, uh, the first uh, couple of points uh, I want to make are around the state's economy. 2012-13, the Western Australian economy, as measured by gross state product, grew to $253 billion. That's a pretty big economy. Now, if we could hive ourselves off from the rest of Australia, which might not be too bad sometimes, hive ourselves off, uh, we'd be almost in the top 40 economies uh, in the world. Uh, we have grown uh, quite significantly in the last few years. What I found interesting was to have a look at that rate of growth. To get from 100 billion to 150 billion took WA 10 years. To get from 150 billion to 200 years, 200 billion took us seven years. To get from 200 billion to 253 billion took us five years. So we've been through a, a very strong period of economic growth in this state. <clears throat> Interestingly, uh, over that decade, the Western Australian economy grew on a per annum basis by 4.8%. New South Wales over the same period, 2.2%. Um, Victoria over the same period, about 2.8%. So there's been a, a fairly strong, a very strong period of economic growth in WA. But it's not just about the growth in the size of the cake, it's about the composition uh, of the economy. This is an obvious statement. But what has happened in the last decade um, has been that mining and mining-related construction has grown significantly as a sector of the economy. Everybody knows that, but it is interesting to put it into perspective. At, uh, in 2000, 2001, mining and construction uh, accounted for 26.5 per cent of GSP. Uh, it now accounts for 42.1 per cent of GSP. So there's been a very significant structural shift in the West Australian economy in the last decade. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, it is sometimes difficult to manage, uh, but it certainly has happened. What are some of the challenges that that type of growth uh, can bring? Uh, factor price inflation, you know, whether it be wage, land uh, or whatever. Uh, increased exposure, in the case of WA certainly, and to a lesser degree, but importantly to Australia, to the international sector both in terms of investment flows and also in terms of export flows, and some problems dealing with some of the structural adjustments, and this is mainly a, a Commonwealth issue, uh, that that sort of structural change 
um, delivers. And one of the great public policy areas that we sort of abandon as a nation is how we deal with this structural change. I will have debates on issues from time to time, like should that fruit tinning company stay or should that car manufacturer close, but there's actually a broader public policy issue uh, around structural change. What's made that happen in WA? Again, obvious, but when you see the magnitude, you understand why. In the last uh, five or six years in particular, a massive increase in business investment in WA. First part of the decade, economic growth was largely driven by the housing construction sector. Uh, however, uh, the, the recent economic driver has clearly been business investment. In 2012-13, business investment in WA reached $74.9 billion, $74 billion. That was 28% of the total level of business investment in Australia. Uh, an, an amazing level of growth. So up to 12-13, that's what's happened here in WA. What's that meant? As I said, very high growth in gross state product, pretty big economic pie, uh, one uh, highly imperfect measure of economic growth or economic wealth is a GSP per capita type figure. Uh, GSP per capita in WA is now over $100,000 a person. Now we all know that that is not evenly distributed across the community, but it's a measure. To put it into perspective, uh, in Queensland and New South Wales it's $61,000 per person. In Tasmania it's $48,000 per person. It's almost inconceivable that in a country like Australia you can have such a large disparity uh, in terms of uh, that particular economic measure. What else has happened? We've had incredible population growth in this state. We haven't had population growth like this since the, the gold miners came across in the 1890s and moved out to the eastern gold fields. Last year 82,000 people extra added to the state's population, the biggest source of that uh, overseas migration. We've had very strong jobs growth in WA in the last few years and we've established very strong um, investment and export linkages to China. WA accounts now for about 70% of Australia's exports to China. We account for about 55% of direct Chinese investment um, into Australia. So we have a very important role to play uh, in that relationship. But what's interesting is uh, what is happening now as we look to the next few years. Uh, this chart here has uh, two different parameters on it, state final demand and what we call um, gross state product. Gross state product is the domestic economy plus exports and imports. State final demand is simply domestic economic activity. Everybody knows that investment is slowing down in WA. We are moving from this construction phase into the export phase that is a normal part of the economic cycle in a resources economy. It's happened a few times before, not with this magnitude. It'll probably happen again. But this reduction in imports uh, and this increase in exports does have an impact on the state's economy. To put it into perspective, by 2016-17, we anticipate that business investment will have declined from the 75 billion down to around 58 billion. So around a 23% reduction in business investment per annum across the next four years. That's big, but it's important to understand that by historic levels, business investment uh, is still strong, but it's no longer there as the domestic economic driver, replaced by exports. So when we have a look at this chart, the light blue, gross state product, we look at that and go, well, that's okay. Three, four, four and a half percent economic growth, not too bad. And it isn't. Pretty good outcome. When you dig down and have a look at the domestic economy, state final demand, the dark blue, it's pretty flat. In fact, minor contraction this year with uh, very soft growth over the next couple of years. Now that will change in due course, but this is interesting um, because it is the domestic economy that predominantly impacts on employment and it's employment that predominantly impacts on things like consumption expenditure. So there are some challenges presented to the state in a slowing economy. <clears throat> One of the areas we see that manifest perhaps more than any is in employment growth data. Employment growth has definitely softened in WA and there's definitely been a compositional change in that growth. Uh, much greater emphasis now on, in fact almost exclusively on part-time employment growth. Uh, hours worked pretty flat. One of the great linkages is between hours worked and consumption expenditure uh, and the, the latter following from the former. So some challenges for us as we deal with this change in the state's economy. 
as we move into this period that I like to call a period of consolidation. You simply can't maintain that level of investment growth. At some stage, everybody has to have a breath and at some stage you have to focus on utilising the stuff you've been building for the last few years. Just a couple of really simple charts, I'm not going to go through them in great detail. All this shows is one thing going down, another thing going up. The thing that's going down is investment in the LNG and resources sector. The thing that's going up is exports from the LNG and resources sector, simply highlighting the point that we're in a different part of the cycle now as we move from investment and construction to production and exports. Interesting little chart here, which again highlights the significance of housing, housing construction, particularly at this point in the cycle to the state's economy. Uh, we are anticipating that in this financial year, 2013-14, that we will see an 11, just over an 11% growth in dwelling investment, which is uh, good, solid growth, uh, and which is playing a major part in offsetting the fact that business investment is no longer helping drive um, growth in the domestic economy. So thankfully uh, that has happened and indeed dwelling investment over the next couple of years is forecast to be somewhat stronger than long-term trends. I just wanted to spend a minute or two touching on uh, an analysis of what this means for the state. Our argument is a growing economy and a growing population puts lots of, pres lots of pressure on us to spend money and to deliver, deliver infrastructure. Just picked a couple of really simple examples. Okay, school enrolments. Clearly, more people live here, more people go to the schools, cost us more money. What's interesting is that from 2000 to 2010, there was no growth in public school enrolments in WA. It was pretty flat. In the last three years, there's been over 22,000 extra students going to the public school system. And one of the challenges that we have in that is every time we get nine students, somehow we employ an extra person in the education system. It's not a sustainable model. That wasn't a problem when employment, when enrolment growth was flat. It's now a major challenge for us, a difficult thing for us to have a conversation with the public about. Second one here is regional road freight. Growing economy puts a lot of pressure on, on freight, puts a lot of pressure on congestion around the cities as well. But freight's interesting. The next 20 years, we expect the regional freight task in WA to double. Again, that will need to be supported by significant government investments in roads and rail infrastructure. So what's that mean for us as a state government? To highlight the point that Peter made in, in very uncomplimentary terms earlier, I understand Peter, but anyway, here it is. Expenses are growing faster than revenue. And this is a challenge for us. Now, we have averaged 8.6% expense growth uh, over the last five or six years, 5.3% revenue growth. It's not sustainable in the long run to spend more than, to have your rate of growth of spending above your rate of growth of income. It, it's obvious. Now, we've been, able to, we've been able to put off the point that expenses cross over revenue and you go into deficit for a few years by making some, some short-term changes to what agencies can spend, pretty blunt instruments, but it, it's been okay. Uh, but it's simply not sustainable uh, in the long run. The other, the other challenge that has confronted us as a state government, we've built a massive amount of infrastructure. We're continuing to do that. Uh, and debt has significantly increased, particularly in the last four or five years. The dark blue line is gross debt, the total amount of what we're borrowing. The light blue line is our, our net debt. Increasingly, the ratings agencies are focused on gross debt, and you can probably see why. So uh, there are the pressures. That's the outcome. So as you look to, or as I look to, and we look to, our budget for this year, it's interesting. Uh, the economy is different now. The economy is going through a period of consolidation. And there is no doubt in my mind that the government business model needs to be fixed up. It needs to be fixed up because it's not sustainable. So as we look at this budget, without trying to harp on about words like reform and restructure and structure and all those things, because everyone gets a bit sick of those, we have to make some changes. So from a government point of view, yes, uh, we'll continue to invest in what we call efficient service delivery. Uh, we'll continue to invest in uh, in our law and order services to make sure we keep our community safe uh, and we'll continue to build on the investments we've made in infrastructure. But I think uh, one of the things we need to be focused on as we build this year's budget uh, is what we can do to secure the economic future of the state. What we can do to do that while the economy is going through this period of transformation. And for us as a state government, that's a little hard. I mean, we don't have these big <coughs> economic levers 
that we can sort of push and pull to adjust economic growth. We have no fiscal policy as such. I mean, we spend a bit, but it's not fiscal policy. Uh, we don't have a control over monetary policy, and thank heavens we don't. Um, however, there are things governments can do that can have a positive impact. As already mentioned earlier, uh, we changed the way uh, we fund uh, the first homeowner grants to encourage investment in new dwelling construction. There's no doubt that that's been uh, one of the factors driving an increase in new dwelling investment in the state. It's a good outcome. Soon we'll change, uh, albeit modestly, the payroll tax threshold. Again, small but important changes. So for me, as we look at this budget, I get some important, uh, an important document soon from the um, economic regulator who is doing, conducting a review of uh, microeconomic reform options for government. Uh, I think it's really important that we use this period of economic consolidation to work out what we can do to get out of the way, in particular in relation to the activities of private business in the state. Uh, I'm hopeful that that will be one of the main focuses and points of emphasis um, out of the budget. The second focus uh, and point of emphasis will be on what we're doing to deliver a more sustainable uh, financial model uh, for government in Western Australia. It is in nobody's interests for the state to run large deficits. And it's in nobody's long-term interests for the state to have excessive levels of borrowing. We have to make some changes. And just very quickly, I touch on the four things that we're focused on doing and will be focused on doing. Firstly, we're changing the way we employ people. Uh, that is important. Uh, we've adopted a public sector wages policy which says every year a total wages bill will only go up by CPI. That's going to be tough to enforce, but if we don't have tough targets, we won't do the hard work. Secondly, we're currently going through a process now of um, a voluntary redundancy scheme. About 1,000 of our workforce are leaving. I think we will put more money into that this financial year because it is currently oversubscribed. That's been a successful tool. And the last thing we're doing is we're changing the law. It's currently in Parliament. It's very difficult to get passed uh, so that we can have involuntary redundancy in the public sector. Uh, I often joke we're probably the last uh, market-based, well, in terms of a market-based uh, free political system, we're one of the last ones in the world where you, don't, where you have restrictions in the Public Sector Management Act that mean you can't sack somebody. Now, we don't want to rush out and sack people, but it is the case that occasionally the job ceases to exist and it is the case, heaven forbid, that occasionally the person you employ doesn't have the skill set to keep doing the job. Uh, at the moment, uh, we're, we're stuck. Uh, I think we need a more contemporary tool, uh, and that's what this will deliver. Helps our management do what we pay them to do, and that is to run their enterprises efficiently uh, and to be appropriately tooled up and empowered to do that. Secondly, we're reviewing our planned capital spend. Now, at the time of the budget, last year we had $27 billion of capital plan to be spent. It's a massive investment program. Can't afford it, so I have to start trimming that back. We've trimmed uh, over $2 billion out of that. No, and we'll keep doing that. Now, that doesn't make everybody happy, but it's really important that we do it at this particular stage. Third thing we're doing is we're restructuring our balance sheet. Uh, we have things on our balance sheet that the private sector can own and operate, and we simply don't need to be active in that space. I've talked about it, Premier started talking about it, and we are actively looking at, at land, we're actively looking at port infrastructure, uh, we'll be actively looking at some of the infrastructure owned and operated by our utilities, I think it is very sound reform. Delivers us better balance sheet outcomes uh, and I think it's going to deliver better asset utilisation in the long run. Just an example of the sorts of things we're doing. Dampier Port, very important port to the state in the north. Last week government approved them basically selling the multi-user infrastructure that they have at the port. Uh, why? Um, we're pretty keen to get the capital. Secondly, the existing infrastructure needs to get upgraded. And thirdly, there will be a requirement that additional infrastructure is provided. So as a state, we get a much better outcome. And you'll see this model being rolled out increasingly, uh, and not only in our ports. I think it's a perfectly logical time for us to be doing it as a state government. Not a fire sale, but an important process. And finally, uh, we have to look at our business model, as I said, and do things differently. Doing things differently means asking ourselves a simple question with every dollar we spend, and that is, do we still need to spend it? And if the answer is no, we should stop. And if the answer is yes, we need to say, is there a better model to do it? Does that better model to do it involve using the not-for-profit sector? Often it does. Does it involve using the private sector? Uh, often it does. Uh, and you know what? We shouldn't be embarrassed about that. There's a lot of ill-informed political debate 
not economic debate, but political debate in this state about who owns what and does what. And we have to push through some opposition to some of the things we're going to want to do. But I remind people, when you go to Joondalup or Mandra or soon Midland, you know, when you pull up crook at a hospital, you don't check who owns the hospital or who employs the nurse. You want to get fixed up. And that's what we're going to do. And they are privately owned hospitals. When you get on a bus, the driver of the bus is employed by the private sector. The bus is operated by the private sector. Some of our most efficient prisons are operated by the private sector, even to the point now when you go and get your motor vehicle inspected for licence. In a lot of the places in Perth now, it's done by the private sector. Uh, this is good uh, and important reform, uh, and we intend to deliver on that front. I just want to close with a quick observation, and that is, sure, the state's economy is changing. The domestic economy in particular is a little softer. But when you drill down and have a look at Western Australia and our economy and the businesses that operate here, the fundamentals in our state are very, very strong. Uh, and we remain a fantastic place to invest and a fantastic place to do business. From the government's point of view, we are very committed to supporting our economy and building on collectively um, our achievements. That means we'll be, there'll be more activity, as I said, around microeconomic reform, and it means we have a very, very strong resolve uh, to restructure uh, and to reform the government business model. Um, last year, one of the ratings agencies said that the, one of the problems over there in WA is that government, they, they haven't got the political ticker to do hard things. And uh, they were probably right. But I'll give you a tip. I don't think they'll be saying that um, for much longer. Uh, we understand we need to change uh, and we intend to. Can I close by thanking CEDA uh, for providing me the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Thank you.